everyone. Uh, welcome to the fourth uh, webinar on the data in diversity, sorry, diversity in data series um, this week. Uh, my name is Jagda Bogle and uh, I'm the inclusivity officer and the um, academic liaison officer for the BCS Data Management Specialist Group. Um, just share a slide. Oh, see my cursor. There it is. The um, yeah, my cursor's disappeared. But just this slide just shows basically that the event uh, has been organised by um, the BCS Data Team, BCS Women, and the Dharma UK Group. Um, the focus of uh, these webinar series is that we're looking into diversity and how lack of diversity impacts us. Um, so we've got some really interesting talks um, uh, this week uh, covering different perspectives, different dimensions of this topic. And to be honest, the talks we've heard so far have really blown my mind. They're really interesting. Um, so uh, it's, it's a really interesting topic. The to get to the next slide. So this slide shows the um, list of talks um, that have been planned. Uh, the, the series was started off uh, by a member of the BCS Women Group, Tristy Tanaka. She did a really excellent talk on the curvy path. Um, and then we had Brenda Tambe looking at the business case for diversity. Um, and uh, and, and um, this morning we had Jenny Andrews from the Open Data, uh, sorry, from the Dharma UK um, talking about um, think uh, neurodiversity and thinking differently about data. Um, so today's talk um, is called um, Not All Equal. Uh, it's a more inclusive visualization of data. Um, but before I introduce the speakers, I uh, just want to say that if you do have any questions, please post them in the questions. Um, also, if you're interested in any of those events that are appearing on the slides, tickets are available uh, on the um, BCS Data Management Group, so please book yourself onto some of these uh, events. So if you could post your questions on the question and answer box. Um, this event is being recorded and will be available on BCS Data Management YouTube channel. Um, so. Before I, before I um, hand over, I'll just quickly introduce the speakers. As I said, the talk today is not all graphs are equal, and we're looking about um, how we can um, in, in improve the diversity in, in the graphs. Um, so with the two speakers we've got today are Marco Bernardis, who is head of, uh, head of um, design at Applied Works, um, he's interested in data narratives and the strong, uh, is a strong advocate for user-centered design. Um, also, we have Grace Trichy, who is a designer at Applied Works and is interested in how we make data more inclusive and accessible. So um, apologies for the um, problem with the slides that I had earlier, but I hope um, all the information has come through. So now with Without further ado, I'll hand over to the speakers, uh, Marco and Grace. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for having us today. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, I hope you can all see my screen. Just move around things here. Okay. Um, we should be ready to, to start. Um, so uh, we are Mark and Grace, and we um, both work for Applied Works. 
Plightworks is a um, quite small design studio. We are 12 people and uh, we are based in uh, Somerset House here in, um, in London. And what we do is to, to work with the companies, organization, people and institutions uh, who sort of share our vision and values. And we support them in making more data uh, more meaningful, uh, turning them into um, digital products which are engaging, accessible, and simple to use. Um, everything that we do is sort of uh, guided to our um, guiding principle, uh, which is that we believe in the value of shared understanding to generate positive change. And uh, I think that this is particularly true when we talk about data visualization, because data visualization is uh, um, a sort of language that can really help us in uh, uh, mapping very complex topics and complex phenomena and turn them into powerful visual, which are um, easier to um, easier to understand. Um, data visualization might uh, sound as a very new uh, discipline, uh, but instead um, has been used quite uh, um, for a while in the, in the story of the, of the mankind. It's a discipline that has a couple of centuries of uh, uh, history, at least. And we want to start this talk uh, um, presenting a couple of um, historical case studies, which are uh, particularly interesting in uh, demonstrating how uh, data visualization has been used to um, to support decision making, uh, decision making, and also to um, have a very positive impact in um, in the daily life of many people. Um, so this first case study is a, is a work by Florence Nightingale, and maybe some of you uh, are already familiar with it. It's quite a famous visualization, and we are in the UK. We are in the 19th century, and Florence Nightingale was a nurse during the um, Crimean War. And um, at some point she realizes that uh, a lot of the people who were dying uh, during that war um, were not dying because of the uh, injuries and the wounds uh, on the battlefield, but because of the very poor condition in the, um, in the military hospitals. Uh, so she decided somehow to sort of raise this, uh, this issue with the Brit British government, and she um, decided to collect data and create a report to, um, to present it to the, um, to the British government. And this chart is one of the charts that she used in the report to sort of uh, um, explain her thesis. Um, the chart is very um, is very simple, is very powerful. Um, basically, we have the um, the months uh, plotted in a in a radial way, and uh, the different slices, the side of those slices, is representing the number of um, of deaths. The three colors that are uh, used for the three portions of those slices are representing the causes of, uh, of deaths. And um, for example, the pink uh, part, which is the one on the center, is uh, representing the, the number of people who died because of injuries during the, um, during the fights. Uh, but the, the part which is more, more prominent, which is the, um, the, light, blue, the light blue part, uh, is actually represented the number of people uh, who were dying when they got to the, to the hospital. And they, in the hospital, the hygiene condition was so poor that they couldn't, that they couldn't survive. Um, so she sort of managed to uh, raise this issue with the government, and uh, this report led actually to a reformation of the um, some of the health system in the in the in the UK. Another interesting example: we are still in um, in London. Uh, we are in 1854, and we are still talking about health. Um, there was a very big uh, cholera um, epidemic during that period. And um, scientists were not sure about uh, what was uh, actually the um, why the um, cholera was spreading. Um, so they had two main theories. One theory was that uh, it was the air that people were um, was breathing uh, that causes the infection. Uh, while the second. Um, theory was that it was um, uh, carried the, the, the disease was carried by by germs so via the food or by the, the, the water that people were drinking and um, just now uh, who is the author of this piece uh, started to um, 
map out in a specific neighborhood here in London, uh, which is in Seoul, uh, and um, I started to map out, uh, like going door by door, um, the number of people who died because of the um, of the cholera. And at some point, it started uh, it marked in this map with uh, with those black marks uh, all the people that uh, that died because of, because of cholera. And they started to understand that there was some clusters, uh, and one cluster was very close to a water pump. So he, he sort of um, understood that probably uh, people were um, drinking the water coming from that water pump, and probably the cholera was actually spreading via the, um, the water and um, and the water system. So it was like a way of uh, um, supporting the, the second theory that uh, was convinced that um, cholera was spreading for, for that specific reason. Uh, what I find about um, quite interesting about those two um, those two examples is that uh, data visualization really helped in uh, understanding um, a phenomena in um, which is quite complex in um, in a very effective way and also led to um, very important decisions that uh, actually had a, a very good um, and positive impact on the on the life of people and here we're really talking about saving lives um, the the third uh, historic example that we want to to showcase is uh, instead a work by um, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, who was an American um, sociologist, and uh, this was um, exhibited for the first time in the during the um, Paris uh, exhibition of um, 1899, and. Um, uh, what he wanted to to show with this uh, with this data visualization uh, was how the life of the um, black American communities changed after the abolition of slavery. Of course, many things changed. So uh, people started to do to get um, proper jobs. They started to be able to afford the proper houses, and he created this um, beautiful set of visualization really to. Um, demonstrate how their uh, life changed uh, in a better way, of course. Uh, what uh, is super interesting is, first of all, the, the visual style of those uh, of those pieces. It, it was really pioneering the um, like a different way of looking at data in a, also in a less analytical way, if we want, but more an, in a more designed way. But the other thing which is important is, is that he really managed to uh, give voice to a community that was really uh, not not much represented, not much represented, and was really like a, a minority. So it was a way to um, really surface something that uh, no one was talking about. Uh, doing a bit of uh, a jump <laughs> ahead of time, uh, we can now say that we are of course, uh, surrounded by by data. So um, we can say that data is definitely the, the sort of defining material, the raw material of the 21st century uh, can be compared to uh, our marble and, and clay. But uh, as it's a raw material, we also have to be aware that uh, per se, data can be perceived as very cold, maybe ugly, maybe useless. And it has to be uh, processed, created, and crafted uh, in order to to become something meaningful, effective, and that can be um, actually used. And probably this is the part. This is the role of uh, the um, of data visualization designers. So what we what we try to do in our uh, in our daily job. Um, this is uh, what uh, lays behind um, a project that we did um, years ago for uh, Chatham House, uh, a think tank here in London that you you might be aware of, and is basically a data set about um, global trade, so uh, importing country, uh, exporting countries, categories of commodities, um, volume of uh, commodities traded, value in dollars of commodity commodities traded. And they have collected this um, incredible quantity of uh, information, but they needed to, of course, display it in, um, in a useful way. And this is what we designed together with them. So everything is um, sort of transformed into a very powerful visualization. So we have this uh, map of the world and all the flows are connecting the, um, the countries, importing and exporting, and the size of the flow is representing the, the volume of, um, of trade. Uh, and all the callouts 
that you can see in this uh, video that we have prepared here is sort of highlighting all the different elements that we had to play with as uh, designers in order to make this uh, complexity uh, more manageable. Um, so that's the, um, probably the, the interesting part of uh, our job, really. Um, getting into the granularity of the data that we need to represent and finding the best visual way to to, to present those, those information and playing with interactivity to sort of guide the users into the different levels of um, information that we that the data set was uh, sort of uh, uh, including. Um, this is a, an example of a, a sort of more analytics tool, I would say, so uh, sort of technical topic, uh, but it's also true that uh, uh, there are beautiful uh, examples of projects that are dealing with uh, um, sort of softer data, if we can call them in this way, sort of small data rather than big data. And one project that we want to, to present, which we believe is uh, is a, a a beautiful example when we talk about uh, uh, reconnecting data with our daily life and finding way of making uh, data more um, engaging and close and close to to humans is a is a project called uh, DR Data, which is a project from 2015. is a project by two designers, uh, Giorgia Lupi, who's Italian uh, but she lives in New York, New York, and uh, Stephanie Pazovic, uh, who's American beliefs in London and uh, during that year they decided to um, to share postcards and uh, so one postcard uh, a week for a, a total of uh, 52 postcards and uh, basically the what they really tried to experiment with was to um, identify some topics that were very personal in a way so for example uh, they decided to track uh, how many times uh, they had an argument with their husband or maybe how many times they did complain about something. So they really um, identified the topics that could be very uh, personal in a way. And they create those postcards in which on the front you have a uh, data visualization of the data collect, uh, collected related to those topics. And on the back instead, you have uh, an, an explanation of how to read those postcards. And they deliberately decided to make everything by, by end, which was also something very um, well, I would say strange, like something, a very strong decision, because when we think about data, we always think about dealing with machines, dealing with Excel files, uh, dealing with uh, um, uh, complex calculations. But instead, they tried to transform all these very abstract things into something more uh, warm, also in a way, and of course, beautifully um, designed. I think that uh, the, um, this quote by, by Georgia Lupi is probably the most representative uh, of um, her approach, uh, which is, um, and says that working with data means designing ways to transform what is abstract into something that can be actually seen, felt, and directly connected to our lives and our behaviors. And I think that especially the last part like directly connected to our lives and our behaviors is particularly important because in the end, data is something that we have uh, sort of invented <laughs> because we want to be in control. We want to quantify everything. But if we always keep in mind that uh, they are connected to something real, that definitely helps to, um, to create with them something, uh, something beautiful. Um, so, talking about how data are related to, um, to our daily life, uh, I think that everyone um, is familiar with this curve, uh, which is the, the number of uh, infection um, of COVID-19 during 2020, 2021, uh, 2022. And um, this is uh, probably the, the demonstration that uh, 
uh, data visualization is right now becoming something very uh, common, something that people are used to see in order to get information, uh, something which is uh, becoming even more and more present on the media outlets, on newspaper and such. And uh, exactly for this reason, like that is becoming more and more popular, we need to be very, very careful that uh, everyone can uh, read it and can get information from uh, those uh, pieces of information. And I let Grace talk about this topic more in detail. A little bit closer to me. Um, hi, everyone. So uh, part of the second half of this talk is to talk about why is accessibility um, important. And as Marco has already explained, with the growing role of data visualization in our lives, this is becoming more and more important so that we can make sure that information is understood by everyone. Um, disability covers many areas such as visual, hearing, mobility, and cognitive um, impairments. In fact, 253 million people globally struggle with a visual impairment, 466 million people struggle with a hearing impairment, and 75 million people are wheelchair users, and that's not even all of the mobility impairments that are in existence. Um, and 200 million people have a cognitive impairment, which in this case we're counting as an IQ um, below 75, um, which I know these numbers are hard to put into context. So that is actually one in five people around the world struggle with some form of impairment that affects their daily lives. Um, it's hard to imagine what that must feel like if you don't struggle with an impairment, which means that it can be easy to underestimate the power of um, accessible design. Um, I recently saw this talk by Adrian Rossellini, where he talked about convincing clients to invest more in making their designs accessible. And he showed them this graph made by WebAIM, which is the most effective ways to motivate accessibility for change. So you can see at the bottom, there's guilt, which is the least effective way of persuading people. So that's kind of guilty people for not using the right alt tags, um, et cetera. And at the top, you've got inspiring people to make change. Um, but actually he said that he found the most effective way is to make it about me. Um, because it's much easier to kind of imagine the effect that design can have on your life when you imagine it in your shoes. Because the truth is, as we grow up, the chances are we will all become one of those one in five. You know, your eyesight deteriorates. You know, many factors in your life can change. For example, at some point, we probably all experienced a short-term impairment, which can include broken limbs, eye injuries, hearing injuries, head trauma. Most of us have probably been there. This man is, well, <laughs> that, this man um, has broken his arm and suddenly his ability to use a keyboard or a mouse is severely limited, which is gonna affect how he interacts with technology. And then there are also situational impairments. These are situations where fa external factors in your life are affecting how you're using, let's say, technology. Um, this can include multitasking, sunlight, eating at your desk, having a rubbish screen, using headphones, not using headphones, having language barriers, etc. For instance, there's guys at a cafe and when the coffee machine turns on, he suddenly can't hear anything, which means that he's going to be relying on assistive technology, such as closed captions or wearing his headphones to be able to hear. It might be late at night and you're in bed with your partner and you have to turn down your screen brightness so you don't wake them up and suddenly your ability to use technology has completely changed and you'll be relying on stuff like color contrast so that you can see what's on your screen. So anyway, we all find ourselves in disabling situations, whether they're permanent or situational, and we rely on accessible design on a regular basis, whether we know about it or not, and we call this the curb effect. It's a phenomenon of dis disability friendly features being used and appreciated by a large group of people than who we originally designed them for. Which brings about the question, what does accessibility in design actually look like? Well, very helpfully, um, there are some guidelines that have been made for us as designers um, to explore how we can make design more accessible. Um, these come from people such as WCAG or WCAG, I'm not quite sure how you guys want to say it, um, but these provide a very specific checklist to make sure that we're complying with the basic accessibility um, on the web. These include topics like appropriate color contrast, 
Um, it's important to have enough contrast between elements so that they can be differentiated from each other. For the same reason, it's also important to check how colors appear to different colorblind spectrums. Otherwise, certain colors can suddenly look exactly the same. It's also important to avoid color dependent elements. Um, relying on color alone to communicate information causes barriers to access for many readers. Colorblind and low vision users may not be able to perceive color. And color is not also announced by screen readers, so it's not much help to them either. Um, another important one is alt text for visuals. So for elements that you purely relying on a visual aspect, such as a graph or an image, um, you should always supply an alt tag, which can be read by a screen reader. Um, for an example, a description for data visualization may follow a structure of explaining what the chart type is, what the type of data is, and the reason for including the chart. For instance, for this graph, um, an alt tag description might say a chloropleth map of the proportion of women in national parliaments in the world in 2020, where Rwanda stands out as a country with the highest percentage of women at 61% in their national parliament, followed by Bolivia and Cuba with 53%. Then you can see that Papua New Guinea um, is the country that scored the worst with 0% of women in parliament. Then there's also simplified language. This is a super important one for everyone because although it's really fun to show off your fancy knowledge of long words, it can often really disrupt the narrative for people with cognitive impairments such as dyslexia. Also, some of us just don't know all the long words. So really, if you want you know, your projects to be communicating well, it's really important to be simplifying our language to make it more inclusive. And then last of all, we've got accessible UI. Um, this is being quite widely explored by many people at the moment. Um, and it's a general focus on making sure that the web is navigable, um, such as making sure that the button sizes, the padding around a button is bigger, or that the structure of a web, website can be read by a screen reader. Um, whilst following guidelines is good, um, approaching accessibility only from the perspective of, client, of, of compliance really isn't enough. We should consider accessibility as an extension of what we're already trying to do and what we think is fun to do, which is to find creative solutions to issues. Um, I think this project, oops, sorry, this project sums up perfectly. Um, this project is a project called Hid the Blind Spot. Um, it's a collaboration between an Ethiopian charity together and a, chari a charity that supports visual impairments. And that also they collaborated with the design group Data for Change. Here, the blind spot is a data sonification advocacy campaign that highlights a digital exclusion problem for people with visual impairments. Um, the project was performed live by an orchestra, but it's also available online, and I'd really encourage you to check it out. Um, and it's available in multiple different languages. It emphasizes the importance of considering a diverse perspectives in data visualization. Um, I'm going to play a bit for you now. Um, I'm not going to play all of it because it's quite long, but I hope you can get the idea. But I'd really encourage you to close your eyes during this so that you can kind of experience it. Hi, I'm Desta, and I love playing the flute. Let me tell you about my country through music. Ethiopia has the second largest population in the whole of Africa. People here are living 20 years longer than they were in 1990, the year I was born. Here, how life expectancy has grown from 47 years to 66 years. This is all thanks to public health programs that led to huge reduction in child mortality. Malaria, and HIV. As a so I hope from that short clip that you can start to understand that there are some really creative solutions out there to data visualization and sometimes those solutions aren't even visual. It's really about finding what we think is the best solution to making something more accessible. Um, additionally to performing this live, um, um, 
audio files in the story were also played on local and national radio for Ethiopians that don't yet have access to the internet, and for those with visual impairments who don't use screen readers. Radio is one of the most widespread forms of news and communications in Ethiopia, and sharing it on the radio highlights the importance and understanding the context of the audience um, in order to pick the right medium and to be as inclusive and accessible as possible. Um, and if you guys have any spare time, I'd really recommend going and listening to the whole performance because it's really interesting. Um, I want to finish on this quote. Um, data viz is first an act, um, an act of communication and to reach its full potential, we need design thinking to unlock and give voice to the narrative behind the numbers, regardless of the format or media we adopt. Um, and I wanna highlight that whilst following accessibility guidelines is a really great start and we should all be doing that. Um, it's important to consider accessibility as a human experience um, and to think of more creative ways that we can overcome barriers in sharing information. Um, and that's it from me today. Um, thank you for listening. Um, and I also want to say we run a quite interesting newsletter. Well, I say it's interesting because we, we make it. Um, <laughs> but we share um, interesting projects every month by designers we're inspired by. Um, so if you feel like checking us out, there's rows and columns. Um, so yeah, thank you all so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grace and Marco, for a very um, interesting talk. Um, two things that stand out for me was the, the figures that you quoted uh, were quite um, staggering for me. So it shows that it's a really important area that needs to be um, addressed. And um, the, the graphs you showed, some of the um, older graphs, it's quite interesting to see them because we always think of data viz as a modern topic, you know, um, but uh, it was really interesting to see that those graphs go way back uh, quite a few number of years. So, um, and that it's been around for a long time. So um, that's excellent. Um, just trying to see if there's any questions. If not, I'll get on with asking my questions because I have quite a, quite a few. <laughs> so, um, the first thing is, uh, I think um, I love I love the sort of Maslow's hierarchy triangle that you showed, uh, where you depicted the reasons for uh, motivating um, accessibility um, changes and then linking them with the effectiveness. Right, so that that triangle was very nice, and I know that some uh, BI tools um, based on the nuances of particular data sets they suggest um, the type of graphs you should be using and that's all done automatically to make our lives supposedly easier um, but I'm wondering is uh, is there something uh, is there something out there on automatically suggesting features or uh, automatically kind of um, suggesting how your graphs can be improved in order to meet the needs of a specific audience? Um, well, I think there are several people out there that are talking about it. Um, the graphs that I was using today were made by Data Wrapper, who have made a very interesting article about making graphs more accessible. Um, so I'd really just advise going out and having a look on the internet, because <laughs> there's a lot of stuff out there done by experts that are suggesting it. Um, and there are also a lot of guidelines on how you can improve that. But as I said, there are a couple of main ones such as not just relying on color and making sure that there's um, really good um, labels on everything that are accessible um, and stuff like that. But making sure that you're not just relying on visual elements alone is super important. Yeah, but, yeah. okay. So, I mean, is that the thing that you think might be coming in future where if, if, if we're dealing with a particular audience, these automated features come in? On, on, you know, for example, in Word, we have a, a readability, you know, how readable is the document? Is it, are these sort of features that you think would be useful? You yeah, know? for sure. I think they'd be really useful. Um, and there's definitely some interesting automation that's happening in the world of um, inclusivity in data visualization. Um, I saw MIT, MIT recently uh, were doing something where they were looking at how effective alt tags are and how we can make them more effective in describing graphs. Um, and there kind of was a discussion about whether one day that would be more automated, because at the moment that takes quite a long time to go through and write alt tags for graphs. 
Um, so I think, you know, with the rise of AI and chat GDP and all that stuff, you know, that might be something that we see happen soon. Um, but I'm not sure about accessibility checkers for graphs. I don't know if you've seen anything on that. Mm, no, I mean, nothing that came to my mind. Um, yes, I mean, what I can add is that, uh, yeah, for sure we can have in the future, well, in the future, they already exist, like way of automating, uh, like you uh, just load a data set and you have a chart, which is sort of uh, generated automatically. Um, I mean, what we try to, to stress, because it's probably part of our job, is to um, really sort of go, go beyond what is made automatically by, by a software. Uh, because, I mean, uh, the, the quotes that uh, Grace shared are uh, uh, stating this, um, this topic in a very clear way. So, is really about understanding what's the narrative behind the data. So sometimes maybe something which is automated cannot really understand what you want to to display with um with a chart. So I believe that like the the human control in co configuring the charts and in um, understanding what is the story that we want to tell with the chart is something that will always uh, need to. Um, uh, you yeah. need to do like um uh trying to, to fighting the, the ai uh, now uh but i think that many things in terms of accessibility actually could happen in the immediate future you were mentioning the mit research grace and basically if we think about like uh, um describing what's happening in the chart uh, having a legend which maybe is uh, uh, an alternative text uh, like imagining that you design a chart and then with artificial intelligence uh, uh, the the computer is actually producing those texts and those description for someone is uh, i mean would save a lot of time i'm thinking it for i don't know newspaper for example imagining that you just have to build the chart and you have a computer which is sort of describing and making the chart accessible for you that would be like a, a perfect balance in terms of like having someone who is curating the chart but using the computer for doing like the the heavy lifting on the uh, on the accessible part um i think that yeah those would be my my takes on on your question thank you thank you very uh very interesting response um i can't see any more questions so i encourage the audience oh, uh, uh, there is a question it, it wasn't posted in the q a but it was um it was posted in the uh, chat and and just as uh Roisin started that the second section um which was about inclusivity and accessibility and, and the changes you need to make in order to bring more people into the data, which it, it was very pertinent. But the, the question is about the call to action from that. And, and I, guess the, I guess the frame of that is about, well, if we can do this with um, visualization, bring more people in, what, what, are the, what are the directions you think that's going to be going in? I mean, I'm, it was interesting to see your um, Ethiopian example and, and talking about the digital divide. And that's something that's, a, a, you know, top of my mind, you know, when I try and um, get my, uh, you know, parents to use technology, for example, uh, you know, there's a lot of different aspects. And I, I just wondered if, uh, if there was a particular direction you thought uh, uh, that things, uh, things, things are going in, in terms of diversity and inclusion. If you want to stop? <laughs> no. well, it's about your. <laughs> no, no. I can't think about it. Um, what I mean, is a direction? You mean more like a, um, what needs to happen to 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 bring more people into the into the data world using visualization? I suppose. Um, well, I think that's. I mean, probably uh, the two aspects that we have uh, uh, tried to include in the talk today was that one thing is about making things accessible more for a, let's say, technical point of view. So like making sure that, uh, I mean, for colorblind or also as um, uh, Grace said, uh, like uh, disability can also be a temporary uh, moment. So like being aware that 
everyone um i mean at some point would need uh could need uh something which is more accessible and this is really i guess like the challenge of digital design in general right now because like there are so many guidelines out there there are so many frameworks there are so many standards so a lot of things has been already quite standardized so you know how to do things but probably now what we have to do as designers is okay we need to be more inclusive so that's really the challenge for for the design discipline and this is one aspect the second aspect is about how to engage with data which was maybe like the two case studies about their data and also the last one that uh, uh, grace explained which is about uh, looking at data in a different way you know so no more like the thing for technical people but like uh, connect them to our uh, daily life so if we manage to, to, to yeah. create this sort of narrative around data and make data perceived in that way uh, from the audience I mean those are really the, the direction and, and what we are trying to do I I mean that, that would be my yeah. answer yeah, I think definitely it seems very important one to be kind of normalizing accessibility because although there are these guidelines, obviously not everyone's taking taking them on because it takes time and it takes money, which is understandable, but it's super important. Um, and I think when I've done reading about the subject, it's also just really important to consider it as a human experience and not just as you know a label or like a following guidelines 4.12. You know, you should be really thinking about what it's like to experience something as a human and putting yourself in someone else's shoes is super important. Um, and what I found really interesting from the here, the blind spot study was that although they originally made this for people with vision issues that can't see graphs, a huge impact of it was that they could share it on the radio um, to a wider population that's much bigger than the people that can't see um, that that don't have access to internet. And I think that's a really lovely thing that comes with accessibility is that it's kind of benefiting everyone. It's not just benefiting you know the people that we think it is if that makes sense so i think that that's definitely really important yeah thank you really good answer the, the, some questions did pop up jagdav yes um so linked to, to the previous question i was I, I asked about accessibility features um could you sort of um give some examples of the current platforms which offer uh the capability of adding um, accessibility features um that's well there, no, yeah there's yeah. loads of out there I I mean, that's data wrappers are really good a really good source um where it can show you um how your graphs are appearing um to visually impaired people um there's some other really good ones like there's a lot of um color making palettes there's one called coolers um that's really good where you can make your the color palette that you've picked to make your charts in and then you can run those also through sensibility checkers that will check the contrast and it will check um how the colors appear for colorblind users um etc um trying to think of a, i mean really checking color is a is a super big one um and that can be done quite easily um but yeah data wrappers is, is really good Okay, thank you. Um, so I've, I have some thoughts. Um, I'm, I'm, after this talk, I'm going to go back and look at our two modules on data visualization um, and see how much we actually do on accessibility and inclusivity. I suspect most of it focuses on the technical aspects of using ggplot and R and what have you. Um, so, um, I, so the next question actually um, links to what I'm saying, which is about understanding the audience and you know uh, trying to find out what sort of skill sets are required to make a career in data visualization so basically what should we be including in the cur curriculum so that the students come out with um, the right set of skills if they want to pursue a career in data visualization um well the, the reality is that is a is a combination of um more technical skills and more human skills i mean this is true for many disciplines but for design in particular and especially data visualization design 
is about being a bit uh, like an, a nerdy person <laughs> so like <laughs> being keen in uh, digging into into excel files uh, into very complex data sets uh, that, but, but on the other side having this sort of sensitivity to transform those data into stories and into something that is uh, actually understandable and useful for people so it's really a combination about those two things the good thing is that there are so many universities that that are um, starting um, courses uh, of um, specialized in in data viz uh, I think that there are at least three or four here in London because we also have collaboration with the universities. We we do workshops with them and such. So um, there's a quite fertile environment in terms of um, like uh, the academic uh, academic world. Um, yes, I, I I would say that these uh, these would be my yeah. my answer. Be passionate both of the technical side and of the of the human side of um, yeah of dealing with uh, with data i would say okay so having a more holistic view sort of technical and the human side yes um, yeah yeah um also you mentioned that um uh language in order to make um uh everything more inclusive we need to use simplified language and and I think I, I can relate to that because when we um, put an assessment description, we think it's clear what students might not understand it, but because maybe we've used terms that they're not familiar with and so on. So I understand that. Um, but in addition to that, to what extent do you think language is a barrier to, you know, uh, to inclusivity not, uh, in terms of where English is not the first language? Uh, is there enough being done out there to actually help people uh, use these tools where English is not their second, uh, their first language? I, I mean, for us, a lot of our work is about making stuff visual. So in, mm. in an ideal world, I would say that hopefully a lot of it can communicate, you know, across languages. Um, I don't I don't have a super amount of experience in in how data visualization appears in different languages. Um, I mean, there's now obviously automation on Google and et cetera into making languages, you know, more diverse. But um, yeah, I don't know about a university level. I don't know what you think. No, I mean, I think that you're right. Uh, what we what we really try to do is to be less uh, text savvy as possible. So like uh, it's true that we are talking about accessibility. So like converting something which is visual into maybe sound or into maybe uh, text. But I don't see like a big problem in um, using different languages which are not uh, not English because uh, yeah, in the end, we want to start from <clears throat> from a visual and then turn in turn it into something which can be, yeah, even something that you listen to, so it can be your language, for example, or something that you can read, it can be another language. So, um, yeah, that's really, really good response. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so is there anything else you would like to add before we finish? Because I can't see any more questions. So, is what you Otherwise, I think this has been an excellent session and I would like to thank you for your time for giving a brilliant presentation and, and giving us uh, lots of food for thought. I'm definitely going back and uh, reviewing our module. So thank you very much and thank you to the audience for joining. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.